After all the publicity, all the haggling, the uproar and the bans, the start of the Packer series in Adelaide today was a fizzer. The players took the field in front of only 500 spectators, and on today's gate takings, the World Series cricket entrepreneur wouldn't have made a cracker. But the cricket stage has been taken out of the grandstand and is well and truly into the living room. Whether it will last will depend on crowds, and Kerry Packer must be hoping for a better showing in the future than today's. And what a sight it is here at the Sydney Cricket Ground. And then you had that wonderful match with uh, the gates opened by Mr Packer at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Kerry went and just said to him, open the gates and let them in. You know, we can't have people standing out here waiting to come in. The Sydney Cricket Ground was absolutely chock a block full. I mean, that for me was, uh, was the defining moment. When it seemed like the whole of Sydney wanted to be at the Sydney Cricket Ground watching cricket under the lights. Uh, it seems to me that that was a point that uh, that defined what was going to happen in the future. In 1977, the cricket world was in turmoil. The cricket establishment had been rocked by the formation of a breakaway competition known as World Series Cricket. In May 1976, Kerry Packer, owner of the Channel 9 television network, had offered the Board of Control $2.5 million for exclusive rights to cover cricket in Australia for a period of five years. He was told the Board had already signed a three-year deal with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation for $207,000. One should never lose sight of the reasons for World Series cricket. They were very, very simple. Kerry Packer watched the ratings on television go through the roof. And he knew that, because he was in the business, he knew that he needed cricket on his television station. With the aid of two trusted lieutenants, John Cornell, who was better known to audiences in the guise of his television alter ego, Strop, Paul Hogan's faithful sidekick, and former champion Australian rules footballer, Austin Robertson, Packer signed in secret the world's top cricketers from Australia, England, West Indies, Pakistan and South Africa to play as full-time professionals for World Series cricket. Every single player approached uh, wanted to join and did join. This is the biggest indication of how pissed off the players were around the world about the, you know, um, what we perceived as unfair treatment by the administrators. The fact that you had more than 50 players from all around the world who had this secret and they kept it. No one around the world was uh, happy with financial arrangements, but then they kept being fobbed off with the fact, oh, of course, there's no money in the game. We needed looking after better. We, I would negotiate, pay for the players, and they would say, right, we can give you three and a half percent. I said, well, no, give us three percent or something like that. And, you know, it's trying to save money for the West Indies. But the point is that we, as a, we didn't know our worth. Now, the guys know exactly what to ask for. I think I got $18 for playing the Shell Shield as, a, as an amateur. So, you know, it, it, there wasn't a lot of money in cricket for us in the West Indies. And then for somebody to offer you $20,000 US for three months' work. When I go back to the bank, I push my red book in again. I say to the cashier, can you update this book for me again, please? Bang, bang, clash. Push like the book. And the first time in my entire life, there's a comma in my savings account book. <laughs> my account is now into the thousands. I've never ever had that sort of money that in my account. And I said, oh, this is for real. There was this unspoken understanding amongst the players that if World Series cricket was to succeed, it would succeed on the field and the cricket had to be good. And the feeling amongst the players was that we were representing our, our country just as much as we ever were. Denied access to traditional cricket grounds, World Series matches were played at alternative venues, such as VFL Park in Melbourne, Football Park in Adelaide, the Sydney Showgrounds, and Gloucester Park in Perth. This resulted in some great innovations in terms of pitch preparation. Portable drop-in pitches were specially prepared in hothouses, and then when required, were put into position with the help of giant cranes. Another worthwhile innovation was the wearing of protective headgear. Put 
could be the first strike and Lily, <laughs> the man to do it. England opener Dennis Amos was the first player to regularly wear the cumbersome helmet that occasionally caused a few hearing problems. Confusion yeah. again, chance for a run at the bar was Andy will be out and another well one out and the World Eleven committing cricket, cricket suicide here with bad calling there, Greg didn't respond to not call. It was a sickening injury to 22 year old David Hooks, his jaw broken after he was struck on the side of the face by a delivery from Andy Roberts that would see the wearing of helmets become a necessity. Just on the side of the jaw and he's in trouble. I was there the day David Hooks had his jaw broken and I was sort of uh, at, uh, at side on and I could hear the noise of the, the jaw and that was pretty, a pretty amazing experience at the time and, and seeing someone get hurt seriously it was, had a big effect on me at the time. I thought, well, yeah, this game is pretty serious. Just on the side of the jaw, the right hand side. And he's retired hurt for the moment on 81. And although we were macho and although we didn't believe we were ever going to get hit in the head, um, helmets, Kerry decided, must come in. When Hooks eventually returned to the middle and faced up to Andy Roberts, his response was typical of the man. It's an air chance, could be six or out at six, he's hit it well. Not perfectly balanced, back live now. Six again, he's hit that one, that's a better shot. That was a glorious shot, that one. That was hooked, forward of the spur gun for the ball before he was caught out of position, but that one was a great shot from the young man making a comeback. There was another innovation during the first season of World Series cricket that would have a profound effect on the future of the game. The playing of cricket at night, under lights, using a white ball and black sight screens. From a television point of view, playing matches in prime time would prove to be a winner in terms of commercial advertising and ratings. But sometimes even great innovations were subject to council approval. The local council were very, very keen that the lights went out at exactly, I can't remember what the time, it might have been 10.30. Uh, and uh, they sent an observer to see to it that this happened. I happened to be watching the match with Kerry. And he's gone, must be gone. You can hear the snick from here, even through the Comrie box window. And Vivian Richards has gone. I'll never forget, it was clear we weren't going to make it. And Andrew Caro, who was the chief executive at the time, came upstairs and said to Kerry, we're not going to make it. We're going to have to switch the lights off. And Kerry sort of said, look, Andrew, fix it. Just fix it. And it's down to Longhorn. He's gone. He's taken. Fine catch by Maxi Walker. Julian is out. A decisive wicket. We were watching this clock, and, of course, the gentleman from the council was sitting over in the corner, I think he was quite happy sipping away at a beer. Caro came up again, said, Kerry, we're going to have to switch the lights off. This is just not going to, we're going to have to. <laughs> Kerry said, uh, fix it, Andrew. And as he was disappearing, he called him back and he said, stop the clock. And I'm sitting there thinking, stop the clock? And of course, the big clock on the other side was the clock that you know we were looking at. And Andrew paused and looked at the clock at the cross, and Perry said to him, no, slow it down. Well, they eventually did slow the clock down. They had to slow it down by about five minutes over a period of half an hour in order to get the match to finish. Now, that, for me, was an example of some incredible lateral thinking. Who would have thought that? That was Kerry at his best. Thanks to some very lateral thinking from Kerry Packer, television viewers right around Australia got to witness one of the great finishes to a cricket match of all time. Two balls remaining, five needed, Wayne Daniel has strike. With me and Button, I said to myself, nah. No, six off the last over. I've never seen him hit a six, not even playing what kind of cricket. And then I said, I, you know, I remember walking on the wicket and seeing him, hey, what's going to happen? He said, don't worry, man. I said, don't worry. I go over to Mick and he, he says, have you got any ideas? And I said, well, 
run in and bang it in short and you know because I don't think he'll I don't think he'll be much of a hooker and he just looked at me and said oh mate he said I can't bounce one that high on this pitch he said it's a pretty slow pitch I can't get it up that high I said okay I said all right well then jam it full down the leg side uh, he can't do much with that the West Indies take their chance and pick up a single for Wayne Daniel and then take their chance that Joel Garner can hit a boundary off the last ball had their conference and will have decided that or that Wayne Daniel goes for the doctor with this second last delivery in Malone. He's hit it many a mile. He's six miles and it's over. A magnificent hit from Wayne Daniel. Mick Malone pitching down the wreck side and look at the jubilation in the West Indian room and rightly so. for six runs and what a finish to a magnificent match. We went back to the hotel absolutely distraught. Uh, Mick Malone got on the phone to his wife Lynn and wanted some sympathy and she said, before you say anything, Mick, before you say anything, the replay is on. I don't know the result of the game. Don't tell me what happens. Well, which Mick just put the phone down and went out and got terribly drunk, as he should have. But it was a huge blow. Oh, my goodness. The Board of Control had banned all Australian players who signed for World Series cricket from playing any test or first-class matches. With many experienced test players no longer available, 41-year-old Bob Simpson was recalled after an absence of 10 years to captain Australia in a five-test series against India. I was playing club cricket at the time. I was still probably scoring more runs season by season than most players around. Then I got a call from uh, the board uh, through Freddie Bennett. And finally I met uh, with Fred and uh, Bradman. And uh, Bradman convinced me, based in many ways on any doubts I might have had whether I could make it. And he just illustrated virtually his comeback in 46. That he was about the same age. And uh, it's very hard to... Be, to uh, refuse someone who comes up with you know, an argument such as that. Now yeah, that's one he can put away, which he has done pretty effectively. Bob Simpson made an impressive comeback to Test cricket, scoring 538 runs at 53.9, including two centuries. He led his young side to a 3-2 victory over India in what turned out to be an entertaining series. And that's Australia's 100 up. One of those young players striving to make his mark was Kim Hughes. That's a good shot from Hughes. That's true. And it'll be four. Beautiful batting. Realistically, of the blokes that played in that series, maybe one or two would have got a game in, in, in our best 12. The rest would have been playing shield cricket, maybe came in for an injury or two, but would have hardened up playing shield cricket. Bob Simpson led his young side on a tour of the Caribbean in 1978 against a full-strength West Indian side. The young Australians were comprehensively beaten in the first two tests. West Indies versus Series Cricket as that is, were involved in the West Indies team. Because Packer initially had said to the West Indies Cricket Board that he would always make the West Indies players available to play for the West Indies whenever they were needed. And so they were involved in that series when Australia came out there in 78. We played the, uh, the full-strength West Indies side in the first test in, uh, in Trinidad, I remember, directly where we were sent in on a wet deck. And uh, we didn't last long, of course, in that first innings. It was difficult, it really was. It's, uh, you're looking at a situation where they've got all their great players, they're at the best. We've got a team of youngsters. A subsequent dispute over selection before the third test in Guyana saw all the West Indies World Series players withdraw from the remainder of the series. This helped even up the contest, and Australia was able to salvage some pride, eventually going down 3-1 and surrendering the Frank Worrell Trophy. It's about to go up. Graham Yallop is about to toss for Australia. Bob Simpson retired after the West Indies tour, and Graham Yallop was appointed captain of Australia for the Ashes series against a strong England lineup led by Mike Brearley. I just recall the dinner. We had a dinner prior to the first uh, day's play, and uh, I just looked around at all the players, and I could see the the young expressions 
on their faces, the the inexperience, the players who had never played a test match to think, I could see them thinking, well, what what's going to happen tomorrow? You know, they, they just didn't know. We had a lot of young kids left that some of us shouldn't have been playing. We had to be thrust into roles that we should never have had at that stage. Uh, and Australian cricket suffered. Australia keep a fire. So Willis turned now to bowl to the Australian captain into the left under Graham Yellop. And gets a good one and has got an outside edge and he's gone and Gooch has made no mistake this time. Willis breaks through again. Four Australians out. The score is only on 19 and it's been very much England's morning here. We felt in the back of our minds that, uh, that you know, the best players uh, of the era were playing in another competition, and we, yeah, we certainly, uh, we felt that uh, this wasn't the best Australian side that could be selected. That fellow's solidly built, and there's a good outswinger, he's moved away, and both of them have struck again in his very first over. Kim Hughes has gone. In 78-9, it was my first tour, I think, and uh, I remember us bumping into the guys that had gone to World Series at uh, the Aussie Boys at the airport, and they actually wished us luck, wished us well. I thought, good God, there must be some friction over here. Lachlan facing with us. And that's hooked away, it's gone down to Lever at long leg, and he's taken a great catch. And they've fallen for the bouncer again. And would you believe Australia have lost six wickets here this morning in less than an hour and a half's play? But the facts of the matter really are that it was uh, uh, England's first 11 minus about four versus Australia's third 11. And it was never going to really be a, a contest on the field. In fact, uh, I think the Australian third 11 did pretty well to win one game. The, the, the pressure on me was incredible from the Australian Cricket Board, from the Australian Cricket Public, from the media, from my own friends, from within the team. The pressure was so intense and at times unbearable. Graham Yallop was on a hiding to nothing. That was pretty clear uh, early on. I mean, to us looking from the outside, uh, he wasn't your regular forceful type of uh, Australian character that we were used to coming across uh, as a, a captain. And one had the feeling sometimes that uh, his strings were being pulled by the, the sort of Bob Parrish, uh, Ray Steele brigade and that uh, the, the public face of official cricket uh, had to be a kindly one, and they chose Graham to provide that face. Now Australia has two left-handers at the crease in Yellup and Border. And away it goes from Border, with a run inside that, and sailing out from the mid-wicket boundary. So Botham to Border, Border on 43. One young player who made his debut in that 1978-79 Ashes series would go on to have a profound impact on Australian cricket in the following decade. His name was Alan Robert Border. The feeling to me in that dressing rooms, that in that initial stages of my uh, test career was everyone was looking over their shoulder about uh, who's going to get the chop next. We weren't playing very well. <laughs> That's his 15. And a very generous round of applause from this rather large Sydney crowd. Three rounds. And that's his first 15 test matches. Well played, Alan Border. England won the series easily, handing out a 5 1 hiding to Australia. Attendances were down, and the Australian Cricket Board lost over $440,000 that summer. Even more worrying for the establishment was that at the other end of town, World Series cricket had really begun to capture the public's imagination. You've been training all the winter, and there's not a team that's fitter, and that's the way it's got to be. Because you're up against the best, you know. This is super test, you know. And you've got to beat the best the world has seen. Lily's pounding down like a machine. Goes making divots in the green. Marsh is 
taking wickets. Books, he's clearing pickets, and the chapel's eyes have got that killer clean. Mr. Walker's playing havoc with the bats. Red Pop, it's good to see you back. Let his make a run. Chewing gum and Gilmore's wilting willow like an axe. Come on, Ozzy, come on, come on. Come on, Ozzy, come on, come on. Come on, Ozzy, come on, come on. Come on, Ozzy, come on. And what a sight it is here at the Sydney Cricket Club. During the winter of 1978, Kerry Packer secured permission to play World Series matches at the Sydney Cricket Ground after the New South Wales government sacked the trust that ran the SCG and appointed a new trust that allowed light towers to be erected at the ground. The first match played under lights at the SCG on November 28, 1978, attracted a crowd in excess of 50,000 people. The future of cricket was there for all to see. And with the roar of the crowd, and the crowd are singing along with this, come on, Aussie, come on. It suddenly, you know, it was one of those, the hair on the back of your neck, standing up situations, you see. We had cricket on the lights before, yes, but not on a traditional cricket ground. And this time here at Sydney, when we looked out into the stands and saw that they were full. A good shot. Lads timed that beautifully, going way down the hill towards the fence at the southern red again. A good shot, great shot. World Series cricket was the toughest cricket I played. Um, up until that point, uh, I didn't realise it at that point, but up until that point I'd got away with perhaps using 80% of my talent. Uh, I needed every ounce of talent that, uh, that I had uh, during World Series cricket. World Series cricket was most definitely the toughest cricket that I've ever played. And, and I mean, it's... And the reason for that is that there was, there was nowhere to go when you were struggling for form. You know, if you were out of form, your next match was against Andy Roberts, Michael Holding, Joel Garner, Colin Croft, and Wayne Daniel, whoever it might have been. Appeal for a catch, he's gone. Ian Chappell out Port Murray. And we said, yes, World Series cricket is here. They really believe in us now. This is, this is what we are here about. Not just the fact that we are getting well paid, but people are now actually believing that they need to, to come and see this. It was a great feeling. Rodney Marsh said, we're bloody back. The bastards love us, you know? And I think that the indication of Rodney's words were, we have been accepted. Players that weren't even playing in the game uh, with tears in their eyes uh, because we'd made it. That was the moment when we felt we were accepted as the Australian team. We were the Australian team. It was that night at the SCG. And after the um, finale of that match, I walked in, stood in the corner with Daphne and we had a glass of white wine, just raised a glass, um, I suppose you could say to one another. And then when Mr. Packer came in, we raised one to him as well and said absolutely nothing. We just stood there, the three of us, looked at one another and raised the glass. After the 5-1 drubbing at the hands of the old enemy, England, Australia played two tests against Pakistan. The Australian Cricket Board invited Kerry Packer to lunch on a day when there were just 2,700 spectators scattered around the vast expanse of the Melbourne cricket ground. The need for compromise was obvious. Was anything said that might lead to a possible reconciliation? Well, I mean, the, uh, the fact that uh, they were nice enough to ask me to have lunch and, and uh, we had a very pleasant lunch and could talk to one another is obviously a step forward, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sign contracts or do anything else, but it, at least we're talking. For the past two days, the Australian Cricket Board has been meeting behind those doors. Before them were firm offers from Channel 9 and the Australian Broadcasting Commission and expressions of interest from two other commercial television stations. The final decision was given to the media tonight by the chairman of the board, Mr Bob Parrish. And the board has accepted in principle an offer from PBL Sports Proprietary Limited involving exclusive television rights for the Channel 9 network for the next three years. Discussions are continuing and finalisation of an agreement 
has been left in the hands of a board subcommittee. After securing the exclusive television rights he had always sought, Kerry Packer brought the curtain down on the two remarkable seasons of World Series cricket. The Packer-inspired cricket revolution has left an enduring legacy. All the other things that have come from World Series cricket have made it a livelier game. The number of new people watching cricket on television, particularly women who um, become intensely interested in the game. Uh, coloured clothing, all those things. Uh, wouldn't have thought of them before 1977, and now would never dream of doing without them. I looked at it in the long term, in the sense that if I didn't play Test cricket again for the West Indies, that I was leaving something there that the players then would know what they were worth. And that's what Kerry Packer explained to me. He said, you know, you didn't think that I would, you know, I would go that far and, and sort of, you know, sort of work to get your guy, you, you guys something. That I, I, you thought that I wouldn't stay with you of such because you went to court and, you know, and it paid out a lot of money to see that this thing did come, come, come to fruition. Initially you do it for the money and because it suits you. But ultimately, you want people to look back on what happened and you want them to be able to say, well, that was good for the game. Sure, there was this unity back then when we did it, but now we've seen what it's done for the game and how it's brought a lot of good things to the game uh, and a lot of good things to the players. I think that it's a special unity because we know now that what we did was worthwhile. The arranged marriage between World Series cricket and the establishment was consummated during the 1979-80 season when Australia played host to a dual series of alternate test matches and a bevy of one-day matches against England and the West Indies. For Greg Chappell, his reappointment as Australian captain was something of a mixed blessing. I never imagined how the job could have changed so much in a couple of years. Um, you know, I was captain of Australia before World Series cricket. Ian took over the captaincy during World Series cricket and then I was captain again after World Series cricket. Totally different scenario, different job altogether in the sense of the demands off the field. On the field was still very much the same. Younger players like Alan Border, who hadn't played World Series cricket, were delighted to just be a part of the new look lineup. I was just happy to be there. But there was a little bit of an undercurrent about, uh, you know, the us and them type situation. Um, but there was only three of us, <laughs> Hogg, Border and uh, Hughes, and uh, the thems. Um, I mean, they, they were all legends of the game and deserved to be there. There was no question about that. But there was just that little bit of an undercurrent. Australia defeated England 3-0, but lost to the West Indies 2-0. Their four-pronged pace attack of Roberts, Holding, Garner and Croft was awesome, and their powerful batting lineup was headed by the master blaster Vivian Richards and captain Clive Lloyd, who took great delight in securing their first Test Series win on Australian soil. The West Indies were set to dominate world cricket for the next 15 years. During World Series, we realised that we were an excellent team and that we, we would do well in the future because we... we, we we, we sort of had a, 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 this, this togetherness. Um, we had this professional attitude um, that we didn't have before. And as we were Lloyd, it was good, not necessarily in field placements and changing of bowlers, but getting everyone to work together and to work for him. And that's the end of the match. The West Indies have won this test match by 408 runs, the biggest victory in any test between the two countries and they have won the series by two tests to nil. The first time any West Indian team has won a test series in Australia. Six balls remain. The relentless pressure of captaining Australia in a crowded schedule of matches, constantly alternating between test and one day internationals, began to take its toll on Greg Chappell. Matters came to a head during a one day fixture between Australia and New Zealand at the Melbourne Cricket Ground in February 1981. The Australian captain, as always, was the, um, the focal point of interest about cricket, not only in Australia, but worldwide. But it had grown tenfold, a hundredfold, I don't know, but a lot. And um, you know, I didn't realise just how much 
of an effect that it, it had had and was having on me until I got to that fateful day at the Melbourne Cricket Ground on February the 1st, 81. I can remember the day, it was an extremely hot day at the MCG and yeah, in the MCG cauldron, as it's known, there's just not much breeze. And I can remember in the field at one stage feeling like we're, we're in a bloody oven or something like that. It was so oppressive. I was exhausted. I was um, fed up, probably. I mean, everything that was wrong about the, this new format impacted on the Australian team. Every weekend, Australia played Saturday and Sunday in the one day as they were going from test matches to one day games, then another test match, then one day games. When it happened, I mean, I'm sure Greg wasn't, wasn't thinking. He wanted to go off the field after 40 overs. He was exhausted. It was a hot day. He was exhausted. And I said, mate, you can't go off the field. You've just got to stay here. I mean, this is going to go down to the wire and, and you've got to be here. He'd bowled his 10 overs and, you know, at the, after 40 overs, he, he was just exhausted. He wanted to go. Anyway, he, he finished up going down to field it on the fence. Six off two balls for a tie. Seven of two balls for a win to New Zealand. Trevor Chappell, the bowler. Smith, the batsman. 52,000 people in front of their seats. Bowler! There you go. Greg was uh, sitting with his knees up and his um, sort of arms around, around his knees at mid-on where, where he was fielding. We'd seen what um, had happened during World Series cricket um, with um, uh, yeah. Wayne Daniel hitting a six off the, the last the ball off, um, off Mick Malone to just pinch the game from us there. Um, so that was sort of in the back of my mind, but I had no conscious thought until I looked up and saw Brian McKechnie walk through the door, walk through the gate, and I thought, I've had a gut foot with this. I just want to get off this ground. We don't need to have to play the extra one day game, which you know, we were due, that was a Sunday, we were due for one on the Tuesday, then if needed, another one on the Thursday before we started on the Saturday, the following week back at the MCG against India in the test match. And I was heading off back to my bowling mark and I noticed out of the corner of my eye that Greg stood up and he's heading for my bowling mark as well. I walked up to him and I said, uh, how are you bowling your underarms? And he looked at me and I think the eyes might have rolled back in his head a little bit. I said, I don't know. He said, well, you're just about to find out, aren't you? I said, well, I guess so. But I'm sort of 80, 90 yards from the action, just sort of thinking, well, you know, I wonder what they're going to talk about, you know, spearing in the Yorker or doing something. I walked over to Don Weezer, I think was the umpire at the, the bowler's end, and I said, Don, you better instruct the batsman that Trevor's going to bowl the last ball under him. His eyes did roll back in his head. Well. It looks to me as if they're going to bowl underarm off the last ball. Rod Marsh is saying no, mate, but I'm sure he's going to bowl an underarm delivery on the last ball and bowl it along the ground and be sure that it has not been hit for six. The umpires have been told, the batsmen have been told, and this is possibly a little bit disappointing. Let's make sure it is an underarm, but I've got the feeling they're going to bowl an underarm. If you haven't believed it, that's a disappointing finish. Disappointed Brian McKechnie, the crowd boo, and it's all over. It wasn't the right thing to do. Um, Trevor was the innocent uh, bystander, as were the umpires and the other players in our team and the New Zealanders. I mean, it was, it was my, uh, my decision and uh, my mistake. I can now remember walking up the long race uh, from the ground to the dressing sheds, and the two doors are side by side visitors and home team and I can remember walking up the race and the crowd of booing going on and the New Zealand boys had opened the door and they were, they were just giving it to us as we were walking up. We all sort of got our heads bowed like trying to get into the rooms into safety. The mood in the room was <laughs> was something different I mean, there you could have heard a, a pin drop. The tension was broken with uh, Sam uh, Sammy Loxton who was a uh, national selector at the time he had obviously come in from the delegates' room, in through the viewing area, and he started to sort of come down the, the stairs into the dressing sheds downstairs. And he stopped, you know, very theatrical at the top, and he was very emotional. And now he said something like, well, you 
might have won the game, but you lost a lot of friends and basically broke down. Yeah, Lily couldn't let that go. He said, ah, oh, yeah, what are you talking about? It's in the rules, you know, get nicked sort of thing. And and that sort of broke the ice. Everyone started talking about, you know, you know what had just happened, should it, shouldn't have. Uh, I described uh, Greg Chappell's actions as an act of cowardice, which I believe it was. Uh, and I thought it was most appropriate that the Australian team was dressed in yellow. Uh, I said it was a, uh, the most disgusting episode that I could recall in the history of cricket, a game which used to be played by gentlemen. The underarm incident doesn't haunt me. Uh, I mean, I've come to grips with that a long time ago. I mean, I made a mistake. I admitted that. If I meet somebody for the first time uh, and maybe they don't know what my name is initially and they say, then they find out it's Trevor Chappell, oh, you're the underarm bowler or uh, I, mean, I might be talking to somebody on the phone you know, from a company or something like that and they say, what's your name? Oh, you're the, you know, the underarm bowler. And they think, oh, yeah, that's me, yeah. I informed the Australian Cricket Board that I was unavailable for the tour because of business and family reasons, and that hasn't changed at all. Greg Chappell declared himself unavailable to tour England in 1981. I was gone mentally at that stage. I really, I needed a rest. Um, I, I don't think I'd been much good to him or to anyone else, and I knew that I wouldn't be any good to me being over there because my heart would have been back in Australia, so it was better that I, I stood aside um, for, for that tour. Kim Hughes was named as Chapel's replacement. Hughes had already captained Australia in 1979, just prior to the compromise with World Series cricket. After the truce, Hughes' appointment as captain of Western Australia and vice-captain of Australia under Greg Chapel did not sit well with his more senior counterparts from Western Australia, Dennis Lilly and Rod Marsh. In the normal course of events, I wouldn't have even been thought of being a, a, a vice captain or something of Western Australia until I was 27 or 28, until I had my own grips in my own game and my own life. But the reality was, I was made captain. There was Marsh and Lily, and then there was Hughes, and that, you know, we hated each other. Further from the truth you couldn't get, we were good mates that didn't see eye to eye over situations on the field some of the time. Not all of the time, a lot of the time, maybe. And, you know, as a result, I mean, we just let our feelings be known. But I always got the feeling within that group that uh, Kim was viewed as the establishment's golden-haired boy. Um, and, yeah, he was always, oh, what's the term? Not so much picked on, but, uh, you know, you could just feel there was a bit of an undercurrent there. i tell you, it wasn't easy. You I know, mean, I had to face Dennis in the nets before test matches, and when he would literally change the net, and come on and bowl bounces. A couple of times I got hit before the game, and I had to put up with that. Um, every else thought it was a bit of a laugh. Now, you know, um, I had to then go out and do a job. The job started very well for Kim Hughes. Australia won the first test at Trent Bridge by four wickets and had the better of a drawn test at Lord's. After scoring a pair in the Lord's test, the future of England's gregarious, straight-talking captain, Ian Botham, looked somewhat grim. It was one of the lowest points of his career where he walked back through the Lord's Pavilion, through the MCC members, um, dismissed in the second innings at Lord's, and there was hardly a sound. You could have heard, you could have heard the ice and the gin and tonics clinking, but no more. The selectors, in their infinite wisdom, decided to give me a test match by test match, uh, leading up to the res my resignation, and I did resign. Uh, whether the axe was coming or not is neither here nor there. Um, and I, I resigned, and uh, I, I was actually felt relieved, to be quite honest. Uh, it, was, it was a good feeling. Botham's replacement as captain of England was the silver tongue, more establishment approved, Mike Brearley. Going into Headingley was actually, um, I always remember Mike Brearley, who was appointed captain, came up to me and Brearley said, uh, do you want to play? I said, of course I bloody want to play. Of course I do, I've got things to do. I've got points to uh, make, and uh, I, want to, I want to be part of this side, and we're going to win. And he said, good, because he thinks I'll get, I think you'll get 200 runs in the match, and I think you'll get 10 wickets. The third test at Headingley started well for Australia. Batting first, Australia made 401. England collapsed to the pace and swing of Lilly, Alderman and Lawson to be all out for 174. Hughes enforced the follow-on, and at one stage in their second innings, England were seven for 135, still requiring a further 92 runs to avoid an innings defeat. Monday morning, 
as well documented, everyone basically checked out, collected their kit, paid the bills, and rocked up just to watch the last dying embers of this test match. We're sitting in the dressing rooms at uh, tea time, uh, fourth day, uh, test match, and we cannot lose this game. It's impossible to lose the game. We're sitting around and we're having a cup of tea and everyone's like pretty jovial because we're just going to, after tea, we're going for the mop-up scenario. And just just before, just as we're starting to think about getting ready to go out, on the Headingley scoreboard, which we can see directly across the ground at that time from our change rooms, was the Headingley scoreboard, electronic scoreboard, and they're flashing up lad breaks. The odds on the test series, they're offering 500 to 1 against a, an England victory. And Ted Dexter and I had 20 quid each sitting there for Godfrey. We couldn't, in a two-horse race, let 500 to 1 go unbacked. And we never got it on. So, of course, uh, we've got a few punters in our, um, our midst, uh, one of them being Lily, who says, 500 to 1, jeez, we have a dash at that. 500 to 1, you've got to be kidding. History states that our friend Marsh and Lily uh, put the, uh, the odd... Uh, Ten pound. So he instructs our um, bus driver. Um, I just remember him as the geese. Called everyone the geezer. You geezer, this geezer. So he became the geese, and um, he he gives him a tenner to go around to Ladbrokes. I think Dennis had ten quid on Australia, and I had five quid on Australia as an afterthought. Uh, on England, sorry, as an afterthought. However, Ian Botham set about trying to shorten those five hundred to one odds on an England victory. He'd already taken six wickets and scored 50 in the first innings, but no one could have dreamed of the innings which followed. After 12 matches as captain, which saw his form suffer disastrously, he played the innings of his life. He smashed the Australian bowling all round the ground and reached 99 without any fear of losing his wicket. And he reached his century, his seventh in Test cricket, in the same brave fashion of only 87 balls. Even both of them must now have second thoughts about being England's captain again. It was Mike Brilly who led the applause as Botham saved England from the humiliation of an innings defeat. The magic of both, that's both, you know, and they went over the stumps, through them, around them, or whatever it is, and we just didn't, the bowlers were buggered. And he chanced his arm because he had nothing else to do. It was all simply born of the fact that the situation was so hopeless that it didn't matter what happened. And for Ian, of course, it was this great physical and emotional release. And you could just see it dawning as, as Ian's innings progressed and people like Graham Dilley kept in company and even Chris Old kept in company for a while. Um, yeah, but as the innings progressed, it went from just a slogathon to actually something more dangerous. Both of them received wonderful support from the bowlers, Willis, Old and Graham Dilley, who scored a very valuable 56 runs. And a lovely way for Graham Dilley to get his maiden test 50. It's really been a splendid innings. When the England innings finally ended, both them remained 149 not out, and Australia was left to score just 130 runs to win the Test match. Once England now got a lead, it now you know, the slim chance of actually doing something with this game had opened up. Botham was given the new ball to see if he could add to his 199 runs and his six first innings wickets. Wood gone for 10, but Australia were still clear favourites. As Willis began his best ever bowling spell, Australia only wanted 74 to win with nine wickets left. Shuffle out and two down, but plenty of time to get the runs. And that brought Kim Hughes to the crease, but both of them still hadn't finished his great all-round performance. This time there was no mistake in the slips, both of catch dismissed Hughes for a duck. Willis picked up his third wicket off 11 balls before lunch. Australia must have spent lunch thinking their last six batsmen could score 72 runs. I think then the balance of power changed in the match. We went from despondency to hope during that lunch interval. 
you could you, you could feel the mood and tension in our rooms. We always thought that uh, the number of runs we had to get was always gettable. But if they did, they reckon without the fighting spirit of Bob Willis. And that was the end of Dyson, the century maker in the first innings. In that first innings, England had dropped some easy catches, but today it all came right. Dilly was under tremendous pressure as the ball soared above his head. Marsh gone and a fifth wicket for Willis. By now the bookmakers who'd offered 500 to 1 against England must have been sweating. Lily had scored a valuable 17. The odds looked to be against Gatting making the catch. So the last man in and 19 to win. Willis 8 for 43. England had won by 18 runs after having to follow on. Probably half the population of the country thought I was on drugs of some sort. I was certainly, uh, uh, the buzzword is these days, focused or in the zone. Bob Willis uh, is the unsung hero, really, of, uh, of that game. As always, the batsman gets the accolade, the bowlers get on with it and, you know, bad luck. Uh, well bowled, but uh, we're giving the man of the match to the batsman. And that's always the way it's been. It's probably the worst feeling I've ever had in, in cricket uh, before, since, later, now. Just sitting there, just totally desolate about how could we have let that game go. How much have you just collected? Two and a half grand. Two and a half thousand pounds? Yeah. So you put how much on when? A fiver at 500 to one. So many people in the crowd had had a pound or two pound on it. So by that, by everyone, all the little one and two pound bets, lad breaks have been cleaned out. Uh, so, but I have a memory of being in, I think it was Leicester, in the dressing room at Leicester, and the geese had gone to the lad breaks and they'd organised to pay out there. And he came back in the, into the dressing sheds and he's had his jumper up like this. And he had all this money in five pound notes under his jumper and he just poured it out onto the table in the dressing shed. And seven and a half thousand pounds was a hell of a lot of money in 1981. You know, we were accused of throwing the match. Well, as Dennis always says, if we're going to throw the bloody match, why would you only put 10 quid on it? You know, I mean, the most ridiculous thing. And as I always say, you know, people talk about match fixing that. Why not blame the Poms? I mean, without a tent, a Ladbrokes tent on the, on the ground, there would have been no betting on the cricket. The next test at Edgbaston produced a similar nerve-wracking scenario. In a match where no batsman on either side reached 50, Australia had to make 151 in its second innings to win, and at one stage were five for 114. I had to go for a walk. I couldn't stand any longer because you were that close, and we knew we'd messed up the other one. It was another piece of brilliant inspiration to uh, throw the ball to golden balls and um, see what he could do. Ian Botham, this time with the ball, ensured that Australia's nightmare continued. Rodney Marsh goes. He's out. LBW. First ball and Botham's on a hat-trick. And I went for a walk and every time I heard a roar it wasn't because we hit a six. It was because we lost another blinkered wicket. I always remember the Edgbaston crowd. And I think all the Australians that played in that and all the English players will remember that as well because once I got the ball, uh, the crowd, the noise, it just built up as I came running in. Second attempt and Bob Taylor grabbed it. Lily is gone. Both are going to count. And there's Boldo. Alderman facing. That's it this time. I got five wickets uh, in 28 balls. We won the game. And uh, for once, the bowler did get the money in action. My choice because it really finished the match. Both them. Mate, shattering. Absolutely. I think that's as low as I felt uh, at the end of that game of, of knowing we should have been three up. We're now 2-1 down. I mean, we should have won that series no risk. We didn't win the series and uh, it was disappointing. I mean, it was, it was just, it was tragic, really. And I think that was probably the start of the decline uh, of Australian cricket. 
Back home, after the disastrous Ashes campaign, Australia faced up to the might of the West Indies. Greg Chappell returned as captain and was soon facing the worst batting slump of his career. And here's Greg Chappell, three consecutive ducks in his last three innings and all sorts of suspicions in his mind about this pitch. And this ball from Michael Holding speaks for itself. And he's gone, first ball, that's his fourth consecutive duck. Greg Chappell, Port Murray, ball holding, a duck. It seemed like it went on for a long time. It went for three weeks, I think, but at you know, the time it probably felt more like three years. Um, it, it, it was tough. Um, it was the first time in my career that I, ha I, I hadn't been able to get myself in the cocoon that I was able to do so often. With Australia reeling at four for 26, Kim Hughes, relieved of the burden of captaincy, showed the huge Boxing Day crowd what he was really made of when he took on the West Indies pace attack. You face a good West Indian attack on an up and down wicket, and mate, that is hard yards, because you could get killed, because you have to stand and play it. And the MCG, she was going up and down, the wicket was wet. Garner now to Kim Hughes. Oh, good heavens. Well, he's got away with it. Firm straight drive, that's a, a wonderful shot. Straight back past the bowler for four runs. And that's one of his better strokes. Hughes was 71 not out when last man in Terry Alderman joined him, with the score at nine for 155. And in fact, it might not reach. Logie is after it and it just manages to beat him. Four runs for Hughes. Well, that's cracked. He really hit that one. That's four runs. Joel Garner to Kim Hughes. That um, was very close to the shot of the day. Partnership began at 155, so Alderman has assisted Hughes now to put on he assisted Hughes to add 23. Good shot. A fine shot and a great hundred. That. You'll see a lot of hundreds in test cricket, but you won't see too many gutsier ones than that. Kim played out of his skin. He really did. One of the great innings uh, that I've ever seen, I reckon, in test match cricket against a fearsome attack. Fellow Western Australian Dennis Lilly then chimed in with a virtuoso performance that sparked a West Indies batting collapse. And it's Nick that he's got him. Water's got him. What a great catch by Lynn Water. That was going like a traceable. Lilly again to the night watchman Croft. It's him with the band. It must be close. He's given him out. He's gone. Out the LBW. Lilly's got another one. Viv came in late in the day and uh, Dennis bowled him three away swingers and then the most beautiful in-swinger was all set up by Lilly. The score three down for ten, the Australians were three for eight. Lilly in to bowl the last ball of the day. He's bowled him! He's bowled him! The last ball of the day, Lilly hitting one to the back, finding the inside edge and bowling out for Richards. Well, what a magnificent start for Australia. The West Indies four down for ten. And the crowd absolutely ecstatic. It was mayhem out there. Uh, I don't think I've seen a crowd go as berserk as, as they did when that wicket fell. And I don't think I've seen a, a bunch of boys out in the field go as berserk. We were pretty damn happy. An important wicket, you could say. There was an even more important wicket taken the following day, and when the, the great Dennis Lilly wrote himself into the record books by becoming the highest wicket taker in the history of Test cricket. Just under 10 years ago, Dennis Keith Lilly began playing for Australia, and this is the ball that'll probably mean more to him than any other delivery he's bowled. That's it. Drake Chappell's got it. That is the record, the wicket-taking test match record. Many of us have been there since the, the start of it, and um, we'd seen what he'd been through, you know, broken back, basically. Uh, had reinvented himself um, from the tear away young fast bowler to the very mature and uh, fantastic uh, fast bowler. Yeah, it was just, it was a wonderful moment uh, in Test match.
history as far as I was concerned. It was the world record and, I mean, it couldn't have happened to a better bowler. I mean, he was the greatest bowler of his time and, and perhaps the greatest bowler ever, who knows. Barry Gomes, Port Creek Chapel, Paul Dennis Lilly to give Lilly 310 wickets in Test Match Cricket. Holds the record now. What a great performance from a great fast bowler. The bulk of his wickets came in Melbourne, you know, on slow, low wickets that didn't give him a great deal of assistance. And the bulk of his wickets were the top six batsmen, particularly the top three or four. And I think that was the important part of it, that, um, you know, when he got wickets for us, he got them when they counted. He got them in the first innings. He got them at the top of the order. And even though he's very elated, I'm sure there's tears in Dennis Lee's eyes as he wanders down. Went to the wrong position, he went the backward point, and now he eases down the fine leg, and what a tremendous ovation. What a long road it's been for Dennis Lee since the 29th of January 1971 when he first started his career. 310 wickets in test match career for him. Tremendous effort. The constant speculation, criticism, an innuendo by former players and section of the media over the past four or five years have finally taken their toll. It is in the interest of the team. For the first time in my life, I suppose, one, I wasn't enjoying my cricket, because I could no longer see any light at the end of the tunnel. I was a, a central figure, through no fault of my own in certain circumstances, in the most traumatic or dramatic period that Australian cricket has ever had and and it was harder for Australian cricket than any other country. the position of Australian Test cricket captain became like a game of handball between Greg Chappell and Kim Hughes. The combination of the demands of the, the captaincy and the, the playing side of, uh, of cricket, post-World Series cricket, and having a young family were the, the two reasons that I elected not to tour anymore. With Greg Chappell unavailable, Kim Hughes was appointed captain of Australia for a three-test tour of Pakistan in September-October 1982. It wasn't Greg's making, you know, of him wanting a captain at home and then not away. I mean, the, the Australian Cricket Board could have said, well, Greg, if you don't go away, well, you don't, you know. And Greg would have given me 100% support, as I did for Greg when I came back and was then vice-captain. Each time I relinquished the captaincy, I didn't expect to get it back. And, um, you know, I suppose, um, you know, had things gone better for, for Kim and, you know, if the team had performed better in, in those periods, he probably would have kept it. After Australia was thrashed 3-0 in Pakistan, Greg Chappell was reappointed captain for the Home Ashes series against an England side depleted by the loss of a number of key players who had defected to play for a rebel team in South Africa. England was denuded of probably 10 good players by the South African rebel tour. Uh, so we were almost a second 11. We had, a, I suppose, five decent players and the other... 11 on the tour were just uh, uh, making up the numbers, really. Botham to Kepler Vessels. There was a South African connection of a different kind in the Australian side, when opening batsman Kepler Vessels became the first South African-born player to play test cricket for Australia. Vessels had played for Australia in the final season of World Series cricket and completed the four-year residential qualification by playing for Queensland in the Sheffield Shield competition. 
Oh, I think what, what really made me want to qualify for Australia is that there was no possible chance of South Africa at that time anyway returning to the international stage in any sport. Um, South Africa at that stage was very isolated. The sporting boycott was um, a very successful one because it, it did bring about um, a number of changes in the country. When I was awarded the baggy green cap, um, I can't really describe the feeling. It was just um, absolutely unbelievable. There it is. Shaw pulls it forward a square. Well played, couple of vessels. The pressure finally off of this young man. A tremendous innings and tremendous pressure in front of his home crowd at the Gabba. I suppose if one wrote a script and you, you looked at a debut test match, um, you dream of, of getting 100 in, in your first test innings, um, which is exactly what happened. Um, it, it was a pretty tight series as well um, at that stage. Uh, England had a, a very competitive unit out in Australia. And uh, I suppose what made it more special was as it was at the Gabba, which, uh, which was my home ground, and there were probably, I think there were six or seven other Queensland players on the side. So, uh, yes, um, couldn't have wished for a better start. Australia was leading 2-0 going into the Boxing Day test in Melbourne. Set 292 to win. Australia was still 74 runs short of the victory target when last man in, Jeff Thompson, joined Alan Border. I suppose my initial reaction was, we're gone. <laughs> no offence, Geoffrey. Um, but uh, then I started to think, well, uh, it's, it was getting late in the day, so I, I, this is the way I was thinking that Jeffrey, look, we just hang in there the best we can and because it might rain tomorrow. The game was over as far as we were concerned and I was down in the dungeon with a couple of other lads and I said, well, you know, that's it, we've lost this one. We might as well have a beer. Good drives, he looks for two, it's wide. Graham coming across, going for the second. Ah, got him! No, he's home! To Tomo's credit, he was sort of hanging in. I'm not going to get out. You know, this is you, you hang in there. I'm going to hang in there. We'll get through the stumps and see see what happens. So by by this stage, uh, we get through the stumps day four. Um, probably only needed what 30 odd to, to win the game. Commentators, players, spectators, and viewers, I'm sure, all tensed up this morning. Australia still required another 37 runs to win when play commenced on the final morning. There were about 25,000 people came down to the ground that day to see if anything could happen, see if Border and Thompson and the Australians could get up. The thing is now we, we've got this situation whereby we're not allowed to move in the dressing room in case the wicket falls, so we've got to do exactly the same thing as we've... So at 11 o'clock in the morning, we're, the guys that were... I made them all sit down there and have a beer. We were getting feedback from the boys upstairs. It was really, obviously, Something I, I would have, I suppose, I should have watched. Once again, Thompson giving himself room. The 23 is now the target. And uh, that brings a smile to the Australian captain's face. That whole morning was surreal. Um, can't put it any other way. We, you know, here we are in a, you know, in a great position in the Test match. With just, you know, Jeff, you know, Tomo, Jeff Thompson, just, uh, let's just get him out and we're just done, OK? Border has gone. And, oh, and in their rush to get it at Jeff Thompson, who was not backing up. The two Englishmen have collided. That's Alan Lamb and Ian Gould. Norman Cowan is bowling to Alan Border. Alan Border is 50, and they'll be looking for two here. And very well run, Jeff Thompson. He's got it through. A speedy across the outfield, but it won't quite go. And so to get to within, you know, that far of losing this game was now, again, tense fingers, tense minds, tense arms. We need three runs uh, to win the game. And I get this perfect ball. It's the last ball of the over, so the fields come in. So this is where, you know, like, tactically I'm thinking, well, if I get the right ball, I'm just going to go for it. Um, and I get this full ball on my legs and... You know, it was just a perfect ball to get some bat on. Now, at worst, get bat on, it goes down to fine leg, whatever, and you get a one. But really, I should have done better. But of course, unfortunately, it hits my pads and goes out just behind square, and, and the fielders are sort of hustling in, trying to stop me from getting up the other end. The captain chose not to bowl me, 
uh, Bob Willis, and uh, Bob had everyone else having a go, and I'm sitting there scratching my head, and I, actually, in the end, I actually went like this to him and said, you know, it's not broken. It's all right. Um, and he threw me the ball. It wasn't until, once again, uh, the ball was thrown to golden bollocks that uh, the deadlock was broken, and that really was the last throw of the dice. Ian Botham balls now to Jeff Thompson. He's got him! Second time, Tabaret knocked it up. And it was taken by Miller. Thompson has gone so close. England win by three runs. Unfortunately, we had to trudge off, and Tomo was you know, pretty England desolate win. about the situation. But um, no, he soon got put right once we got in the dressing rooms, and uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, so close so far. Australia win the Ashes. Australia won the series 2-1 and regained the Ashes for the first time since 1977. A moment of sweet revenge for both Captain Greg Chappell and his deputy Kim Hughes. I remember when Ian retired, my immediate reaction was, you're mad. I mean, you've got years of cricket left in front of you. You know, you're a young man. Um, and I, I mentioned that to him and he said, mate, you'll know. You won't need anyone else to tell you. When the time's right, you'll know. That time came for Greg Chappell in the fifth test against Pakistan in Sydney in January 1984. Greg Chappell ended his illustrious test career exactly the same way he had started way back in December 1970 in Perth with a glorious century. Well, I'm sure there's a tear in Judy's eye there because there's a few people around this ground with a lump in their throat. What a magnificent effort from one of Australia's all-time greats. The crowd is standing here at the Sydney Cricket Ground. It's a magic moment for us all, and particularly for Greg Chappell. Along the way to that final test century, Greg Chappell passed Sir Donald Bradman's test run aggregate, and in the process became the first Australian player to score over 7,000 test runs. This could be it. He'll be back for the third, he'll come back for the fourth, and this run makes Greg Chappell the most prolific scorer of runs in the history of cricket in Australia. It was the time for me to finish, and it was also the time for me to focus on finishing on a, on a high note. Um, the Bradman mark and the, the 7,000 runs were secondary to finishing on a high note and, and making sure we won the test match. Greg Chappell departed, having amassed 7,110 runs in 88 test matches at an average of 53.86. He made 108 in his first test match innings in Perth, 182 in his last test match innings at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Former Australian captain, one of the greatest players ever to wear the baggy green cap and to grace the cricket field on behalf of this country. Dennis Lilly also chose to announce his retirement in the same match. Fittingly, Lilly had the distinction of claiming a wicket with his last ball in Test cricket. It's out. Yes, that's it. Corks at second slip takes the catch, and a great Dennis Lilly departs. In 70 Test matches for Australia, Lilly claimed a record 355 wickets at an average of 23.92. Sad moment, but a thrilling moment in Australian cricketing history. After 96 test matches and a record 355 dismissals, wicketkeeper Rod Marsh joined his two illustrious teammates by also calling it quits. The fact that uh, Chapel Lilly and Marsh left at the same time, I mean, I suppose it was more coincidence than anything else, but when you think about it, um, we all started at the same time, in the same series, and we're all about the same age. I was a bit older than, than those two. And it just so happened, we'd all played about the same amount of cricket. I think I played a bit more. It was natural that we were, we were going to give it away. And when you think about where we were going, the next tour was to the West Indies. <laughs> It made it even uh, easier decision to give it away, and I don't mean that. But I, I would have gone to the West Indies had I been made captain, I reckon. Uh, once again, just to find out if I'd have been any good at it. With Greg Chappell now retired, 
Kim Hughes was given the daunting task of leading an inexperienced team on a tour of the Caribbean to face the might of the West Indies, who were then at the peak of their power. And we played the West Indies an abnormal number of times. And we just started to develop some good team spirit as many, we'd play the West Indies again. And we'd get drilled. We'd been to the West Indies and basically sort of scrambled to a 3-0 loss. I mean, we'd done well to only lose 3-0, not probably 5-0. Uh, we'd, we'd, we'd sort of hung in there reason well in a lot of games, but just, you know, their superior firepower, they just uh, would get on top of us. In the second test at Port of Spain in Trinidad, Alan Border displayed a combination of skill and great courage, defying the West Indies pace attack to score 98 not out and 100 not out, enabling Australia to escape with a draw. Alan Border was one of the toughest that you would ever play against. You know, he. he always took the challenge, he always took the fight. Whenever you played against Alan Border, you knew that you had to get him up. And he was one of the players who we respected. He was tough. And during our time, if you made runs against us, well, then you were classed as a top player. So that's the sort of thing that we, 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 we produced. We, 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 we were recognized as the best team in the world, and you were judged on how well you did you know, against us. And that's out. Lloyd has taken the catch at first step. Just for something different, six months after their arduous Caribbean tour, Australia had to face up to the West Indies again in a five test series on home soil. In the first test in Perth, on the fastest pitch in the world, Australia was blasted out for a paltry 76. Will he get it? He's got it. Yes, he has. That's the end of Kim Hughes. Our tacklers were attacking the captain, make him uncomfortable, get him out as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible. He can't concentrate. If he can't concentrate, he's worrying about his form and the team is going to suffer. The last 12 months have been disastrous for Hughes. In the last six innings in Australia, he's scored just three runs. His highest test score in the last 18 innings has been 37. And in his last four test innings against the West Indies, he scored a two and three ducks. My last 18 or 20 innings were against the West Indies. My average went from 41 or 42 to 37, and it was caught some bold holding. You know, Elbert Garner, uh, Croft, Marshall. The relentless pressure eventually took its toll on Kim Hughes, and after Australia was thrashed by an innings in Perth and lost by eight wickets in Brisbane, an emotional Kim Hughes resigned as Australian captain. In the interest of the team, Right. It's in, in the interest of the team, Australian cricket. <laughs> if there is a synopsis, a brief snapshot of Kim Hughes's career, it, it would be the the resignation side of things that's usually brought up. It's happened to other people as well, such as Greg Chapel, the Under Armour. I said. Mate, what are you doing? You don't need to do this. This is ridiculous. You know, we're, we're playing against a very good cricket team and we're just, it's not your fault. You know, the rest of us, you know, we've got to take some responsibility. But he just said, oh, mate, you know, I've just I've had enough and it's just not working. Yes, I, I had a lot of sympathy for Kim Hughes. Um, probably he was in the same position I was in 1975. Um, we were, you know, we were trashed out of sight and um, and he was suffering from the same thing. But. Um, he, he resigned, but it's not, it's just not a part, another phase in your life, actually. Um, probably should have carried on, and, and, um, and I don't know, you never know, something else might have come of it. Uh, we might have been there a little longer, because people realise how good we were. All, all the other things that have gone on with captaining away and not captaining at home, and the World Series days, and that sort of thing, I suppose it just took its toll. My initial reaction was pretty negative. I don't know whether I want this job. You know, I've just seen what's done to Kim. Do I want to put myself through it? The new captain said he was sure his players would give a good account of themselves. After Brisbane, there was uh, a bit of sadness and uh, obviously disappointment. Um, but I could just sense uh, you know, a little bit of anger and you know, a keenness to just uh, put the records straight. I, I don't have any recollections of being um, sat down and sort of taken through a, a particular process. There was just a phone call. Congratulations, uh, you know, you're the captain. Good luck. <laughs> 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 
After seven defeats in their previous 11 tests against the West Indies, Australia finally found itself in a winning position in the fifth test in Sydney, thanks primarily to a fighting knock of 173 by Kepler Vessels on a spiteful SCG pitch. Vessels on 98. Not played, this will be it. He's flying down the wicket, back for the second. A huge cheer from this crowd. Kepler Vessels has made 100 against the West Indies. Australia had an unlikely hero in 38-year-old leg spinner Bob Holland, who took 10 wickets in the match. Got it. Good catch, second attempt. Six wicket down, and that's good bowling. Not even an onslaught by West Indies captain Clive Lloyd playing in his final test match could stop Australia's push for victory. Drives. Gone! Caught by border at cover. Driving on the up. Clive Lloyd's last innings in the Sydney cricket ground comes to an end, but what a fine knock it was. And he certainly is a big hitter. Hasn't got hold of this one properly. Bennett is underneath it. And what a good pair of hands Murray Bennett has got. And that's a fitting way for the Test match to end for Australia. And Alan Border must be a very, very happy man. The Australian cricket team flew out of Melbourne this afternoon for the Ashes Tour of England. And newcomer captain Alan Border faces a mammoth task to retain the Ashes in the six, set, six test series. Three of the players originally selected withdrew after signing for a rebel tour of South Africa later in the year. Another four who signed to go to South Africa are in the team for England, some apparently after a large financial inducement to stay with the establishment. World opposition to South Africa's policy of apartheid saw that country facing economic sanctions and sporting boycotts during the 1980s. In order to keep interest in cricket alive within South Africa, the concept of rebel cricket tours was born. Large cash incentives were paid to players from England and then the West Indies for international teams to tour South Africa. It was inevitable that eventually there would be a tour by a rebel Australian team. When uh, the announcement was made that um, there's going to be a rebel tour of South Africa and uh, I think it was seven or eight of the uh, rebel tourists had been picked to go on the Ashes series, Look, uh, my initial reaction was, uh, you know, I, I was really distraught. I, I felt really betrayed by it. I was the last part they were going to tell, because I was perceived as he's with the Australian Cricket Board. And I didn't realise until uh, some of the players pulled out of going to England. He, like myself, had no inkling that South Africa was happening. We were these two senior blokes on the side, we got no idea what's going on with our blokes. Out of form with the bat, Kim Hughes was not selected for the England tour and was approached about touring South Africa with the rebel side. After the team was picked, I'm not in the 17 to go, feeling pretty disappointed. They rang up and said, are you interested in going on a tour of, and captaining the... And I said, no. I said I wasn't. You know, and that was when I'd gone on my stone and said, no, I could have easily done it, but I said, no, I want to get back in the Australian side. Bang, you know, I want to go out as a winner. It was what happened after that that reopened the door and they, Ali Buckley said, can we leave the door open? I said, well, you can always leave the door open, but he said, mate, I'm not going. Before we go away, we've um, got this group of blokes together and there's question marks over um, four of the, the fellas that have been, um, you know, had a change of conscience about going to South Africa and staying uh, loyal to Australian cricket. Uh, but there was a lot of question marks about, you know, how much loyalty was there and how much was just a, it was a financial inducement. The four players put under the microscope by the other team members were opener Graham Wood, wicketkeeper Wayne Phillips, Dirk Wellham and Murray Bennett. From what we found out, Murray Bennett had had a change of conscience on his own volition months beforehand and had, had pulled out of the South African tour months beforehand. Whereas the other three, there was a question mark about a financial inducement to, to stay with Australian cricket. And, I mean, there's a, the boys were obviously had a bit of angst about that. Hang on, like, who are you, who are you, where's your loyalties there? You, you've given assurances to the blokes who are going to go to South Africa that, yeah, all for one, one for all, we've got to be solid, yes, yes, we're going to do that. And then five minutes later, you've jumped ship. So who, who were you loyal to? And th these, these are the questions we wanted to find out. 
and uh, we went in pretty hard. I have to admit, at the time, I, I did want those guys replaced because I wasn't convinced that they are there for the right reasons. But after the conversations and, I mean, having a beer with them and, and just thrashing it out, I just thought, well, look, you know, and it was a traumatic time for them as well, but draw the line in the sand, let's move on. When he became aware of the financial inducements used to buy back the loyalty of some players who had originally joined the rebel cause, Kim Hughes changed his mind about playing cricket in South Africa. I remember saying, well, I don't want to play for Australia anymore because it's not worth it, because they had reneged on their obligation and there's no way no one those blokes should have ever gone. And that's not anti them at all. They'd made their boat, they wanted to go to South Africa, that's fine. Now because someone else said, look, you're not going to be out of pocket, we want you to come back and pay for this, you know, and put your heart in it, when these blokes have already been playing against the West Indies and we're already going to South Africa. Mate, you wouldn't tolerate it. How empty did you feel then, given your pride and your passion for the game and for Australian oh, cricket? How empty did you feel? Gutted. I felt, I felt gutted. This is what Australian cricket had got to. You know, um, the spirit of cricket had gone. Um, yeah. Um. Australia's rebel cricketers, dubbing themselves the A-Team, claim today they were ambassadors for sport on their tour of South Africa. Eight years after the cricket establishment was rocked by the World Series cricket revolution, Australian cricket faced its next major crisis when 16 Australian cricketers were paid $200,000 each to participate in two rebel cricket tours of South Africa between 1985 and 1987. Led by Kim Hughes, 10 of the players had already played test cricket for Australia, including experienced campaigners Terry Alderman, John Dyson, Rodney Hogg, Carl Rackerman and Graham Yallop. As I was told prior to uh, 19, or around the time of 1984, that uh, my career for Australian cricket was basically over. And, uh, you know, I was looking, I was only oh, 30, 32, 33 at the time, and I felt, gee, that was a pretty harsh statement to make from a uh, representative of the Australian Cricket Board. And um, so that decision to go to South Africa probably uh, was fairly easy. Hughes answered criticisms that his team was made up of cricketing has-beens. We've got a new name for the team and it's called the A-Team. Uh, you can make your own connotations for that. I, I could see that he was angry with the establishment at the time, so I didn't really read too much into it. Well, I've never spoken to AB about that. You know, I suppose that was just something we, we had to promote ourselves, I'm not too sure. These rebel cricket tours were the brainchild of former South African cricket captain, Dr Ali Baka. In 1981, I became a professional cricket administrator and therefore it was my responsibility, as best I could do, to do everything possible uh, to make sure that the game of cricket in South Africa, that there was interest, there was excitement, there were opportunities and there was development. And if you pull all those four points together, you're, we came to the conclusion that we had no other uh, journey in the 80s other than through the rebel route. The people that were getting out South Africa got it right. You had to affect sport in South Africa to get change. And they did it by obviously not having international sport. And people were just sitting back here for years, uh, getting sick and tired of what was happening. And so I think people generally and the public and the politicians were under pressure. You know, to survive embargoes and sanctions, business, sport, it became a very difficult place to live in and the pressure was there. We were on our own, we were isolated, the, the world of cricket was against us. Uh, we had to, as a question of survival, and unfortunately when we talk about survival, we're talking mainly about the white cricketing community. We took that direction. However, not everyone in apartheid South Africa welcomed the Aussie cricketers. Emotive literature like this has flooded the country appealing to South Africans to reject the greedy Australians. Claims that the highly paid rebels are grabbing the bread from the mouths of the country's oppressed and downtrodden sit comfortably with those who don't share in South Africa's wealth. Essentially an initiative by South Africa's coloured cricketers, the campaign has been taken up by blacks, including one of their biggest umbrella organisations, the UDF. I acknowledge that the tour is wrong. I apologise for it. I do not understand the sensitivities 
the hurt that those tours had, had uh, permeated to the black people's country. Dr Ali Barker's well-intentioned desire to provide international competition to ensure the survival of South African cricket during the difficult years of isolation achieved its ultimate objective. But the A-team, as they call themselves, are being paid too much, have put in too many long hours of preparation and endured too much criticism to do anything but give everything. Some of your Australians who came out, in fact, subsequent to 87, played again for Australia. So I think the standard was pretty good. And, uh, you know, I've, I've said all along, I think the Rebel tours were certainly necessary from a cricket point of view. And I think just what tells the story or sums it up is that when we came back in 1992 how well we did in the first World Cup. The Australian Cricket Board says it won't renegotiate a contract with test opener Kepler Vessels. Vessels announced in Brisbane last night that he was resigning from the Australian team because the terms of the contract offered to him were unacceptable. The contract he's refused to sign rates him at level three, the second lowest rung in the salary scale. Vessels believes the real reason for him being offered so little is because the board wants to punish him because it believes he helped organise the rebel tour to South Africa. Well, I didn't, uh, and I think that that's what led probably to me returning to South Africa um, at the end of the day because I found that to be, to be very, very difficult to deal with. Um, the pressures of being uh, South African while there's a rebel tour going on, um, people thinking that, that I was involved in the initial organisation of the tour and, and, and that sort of stuff, I found it, found it incredibly difficult. And I think I never wanted to leave Australia, I never wanted to return um, to South Africa at the time. And uh, it, it, it was a, a very, very difficult decision, very emotional decision. In somewhat of a double irony, Kepler Vessel soon found himself again representing Australia in the country of his birth, South Africa. They basically got permission for me to join the second leg of, of the Rebel Tour to try and strengthen um, the Australian Rebel Tour team. So I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't on the whole Rebel Tour. I came in and out. I was playing for Australia, for Eastern Province in the domestic scene and didn't really play in the interprovincial matches for the Rebel Tour. I just came in really for the internationals. Um, but as I said, the Rebel concept was, was, was a very uncomfortable one and uh, the next Rebel Tour under Mike Gatting um, turned into an absolute disaster. And I don't think anybody was, co was comfortable with the, with the idea or with the concept. Australia lost the 85 Ashes series in England 3-1. With the Rebel cricketers in South Africa banned from playing Test cricket for three years, Australia had to begin a rebuilding process and nurture some new talent. Newcomer Steve Waugh showed great timing, but his debut was not an easy one. Falling for 13, caught Kapildev, bold Shivarama. One young player being groomed for a test career was a 20-year-old all-rounder from New South Wales by the name of Stephen Roger Waugh. Some blokes give you a bit of lip that, no, really, you just got to concentrate yourself. You can't worry about the bowler too much. If he says something, you just got to concentrate. It was a pretty difficult time to play for Australia because uh, we'd lost uh, 15 players to the Rebel Tour of South Africa and Lily Marsh and Chapel retired, so we basically lost a third of our players. So really, there was a lot of young guys in there who hadn't sort of uh, proved themselves at that level. So it was almost sort of a sink or swim mentality, you know, you sort of um, chuck in the deep end and if you survive, you're tough and you, you'll go on to play a few years test cricket, but a lot, a lot of blokes didn't make it. You could call Bob Simpson Mr Cricket. At almost 50 years of age, he's still making a positive contribution to the game he loves so much. In 1985, former Australian test captain Bob Simpson was given the task of assisting Alan Border to help mould the inexperienced Australian team into a winning combination. I think we started to instil a better work ethic. We started to instil in the majority of players the desire to do well the desire, and the understanding that you only survived in the cricket teams if you performed. And I thought that was a good breakthrough. For me personally, I think the relationship worked really well. He, he's a pretty uh, hard taskmaster. Uh, very good disciplinarian uh, within that group and uh, tactically fantastic and a stickler for doing the simple things well and that's something that we were letting ourselves down. We were not doing the little one percenters uh, well. I think Australian cricket realised that it was time for change, uh, we needed someone there and he was a perfect person, he was strict uh, on discipline, uh, we trained very hard, that was a priority, uh, we learned Obviously, our catching skills improved a lot, 
and we just worked together as a unit. We, we were focused on uh, improving and, and trying to reach a certain level. Whereas I think before that, it was just hoping rather than than, than knowing you, got, you were going to do well. We were in the jigsaw stage where we were trying to build the side, you know, and we came. Uh, we had about five definite starters to fill the jigsaw points and we probably had uh, Stephen Wall, we had Alan Border, Jeff Marsh, David Boone and uh, probably also Craig McDermott with Dean Jones in the wings. Australia's slow climb back to becoming a power in world cricket commenced in the stifling heat and humidity of Madras, India in September 1986. In temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius and 90% humidity, 25-year-old Dean Jones, playing in only his third test, batted for eight and a half hours, battling extreme dehydration and physical exhaustion. I got to about 120 odd, and then I started to have shutdown in my body. My hands, well, just, my hands were going up, and I had to open them up and, you know, and stop them for cramping, and everything was just cramping everywhere, and I was starting to vomit everywhere. And it, I was just, I was just shot dark, it really was. Back then, we didn't really know a lot about hydration and all, all those sort of uh, different things. We used to drink heaps of bottles of soft drink. The team was brilliantly organised for Dino. It was all around Dino at that stage. He would come in and the cold bath would be there, ice would be in the bath. One player would take off Dino's pads, another one would take off the clothes. He'd be dumped in the bath to, cool, to, you know, to, to stop the dehydration and also to cool down. Alan Border said to me right on 180 or when I was crook, he said, I said to him, I want to go off. I'm too tired, I'm vomiting everywhere, I'm stopping the game. I knew Greg Ritchie was batting next and uh, Dino's a very passionate Victorian. Uh, so I said, oh, that, that's fine, mate. We'll get someone who's pretty tough out here. We'll get a Queenslander out here. At least we have someone who's pretty tough. But he was telling us, well, here's the standards. If you want to play cricket for Australian cricket, you have to go for a wall, go through a wall for us. He had the bat and, he, you know, under normal circumstances, he probably would have hit me with it. And he said, yeah, like, can't mention the words he said to me, but it was off was one of them. It probably did lift him a little bit. But, you know, he went very quickly from 180 odd to 210, I think he ended up with. And that's it. I collapsed and I was in, even, I was buckled up and shriveled up like that because I was cramping all over my body. Errol Alcott put us in the ambulance. I found out subsequently that he'd collapsed in the dressing sheds and was in a bad way and they'd had to rush him off the hospital and got him on the drip. So that's when I started to think, oh, what have I, what have I done to this bike? I've nearly killed him. So they put seven bottles of uh, saline drip into me and uh, I didn't wake up until midnight that night. So it was, it was a hectic time. You know, I, I really didn't understand the hassles of you know, de dehydration. Lose seven kilos in a day, it was, it was pretty ugly. The courage to get through to that point of 210 of just total physical exhaustion and uh, yeah, they get much better. Two declarations by Alan Border during the match left India needing to score 348 on the final day. Gavaskar set India on the path to victory with a glorious 90. His dismissal, a magnificent catch by Jones off Bright, gave Australia a glimmer of hope. Just as we got our nose in front and we start to sort of tack, we, we can win the game now. You know, someone like Ravi Shastri, he, he was in there hitting the ball and starts hitting a few sixes. Needing to average six runs and over, Ravi Shastri maintained India's victory charge, hitting Matthews into the stand. Matthews. Several acrimonious incidents finally unsettled Pandit, who played on to Matthews. And the message was clear as the sixth Indian batsman departed. Four overs to go, 17 needed. Sharma holed out to McDermott, and it was seven for 331. Like Kiran Moore aimed a sweep at Ray Bright. He was adjudged LBW, eight for 334. The world's best number 10, Yadav, launched the assault at Matthews. Four to win, Yadav went for the winning stroke, but he was bowled off his pads by Bright, nine for 344. Four the last Matthew over, still four to win. Shastri scores two.
I can only really record two balls in that last over. One of those was one I misfilled at a deep backward square. Um, went to pick it up, and I, I say I got a, a pretty dodgy bounce. But um, So we were sort of trying to work out, well, is he going to try and just go for it? Or how do we set the field so he can't get a two to, to win the game? Shastri levels the scores, exposing Menendez Singh. Ball's tied. If I take the single, that's the last thing Alan Border wants me to do, really. Because uh, then India can't lose. And anything can happen. Singh survives the fourth ball of the final over. Two balls to go. I was at, um, I think it's square leg, and I was just praying that the ball wasn't going to come to me. I didn't want to make two mistakes in an over. I told him, wait for the last ball. You know, see if you can score off the first two. Last one, just go for it. You have nothing to lose. But uh, before that, there was Uncle Vikram Raju who was there right out of Texas, you know, shooting his finger up in a, in a hurry. It's a tie! The match has ended in a tie. It's an unbelievable result. History has been made here at the Chidambaram Stadium at Chepok. My hand is up because there was a definite nick. In, in my mind, there's a definite nick. The ball hit it. And if you look at AB, I, I didn't even shout. I, I was just diving with the ball. Even though I'm about this far from the wickets, you know, you're still thinking, you know, if they run, you know, you've got to grab the ball. So I'm diving for the ball. And as I turn around, I mean, to see the umpire's finger up and our boy's just going absolutely berserk. The hardest thing was one scoreboard said we're in front by one and the other scoreboard said it was tie, so... The celebrations have started. Turn back. Ooh, his hand has already gone up and come down. I said, what happened there? He said, no, no, he's out. I said, when did you give him out? I, I couldn't see it. By the time I turned around, he was... Everyone was walking off the park. And you're still convinced to this day that it was an inside edge? Oh, absolutely. Half us thought we've won, and the other half thought, oh, it's a tie, until Bob Simpson come in and grabbed us. No, it's a tie, it's a tie. So it was quite a weird feeling, actually. Then the realisation sort of hits you that it's a, it's a tie. I mean, that's just... That doesn't happen. Ties, we only had, we've only had one tie, the famous tie, so... Um, yeah, it was just euphoric. I remember storming into the umpire's room straight away, you know, and uh, you know, having a real go at Vikram Raju. In this, in this day and age, uh, I would have been banned maybe for, for a year, for all you know, and gave him a right, you know, real service over there. And he said, uh, it is the right decision, and I'm glad to be part of history. You know, by putting that finger up and being involved in only the second tight test match. I looked at him and I said, you frickin' beauty. Australia's newfound confidence was short-lived. In the first test of the 1986-87 series against England in Brisbane, Ian Botham blasted an audacious 138, an innings that virtually sealed the fate of the Ashes. England won the match by seven wickets and Australia was once again on the back foot. All I kept doing is yelling out to the cricketers club to throw it back because um, he's just hitting it so far. I think he got 130 or something, square cutting sixes and, and here we go. We could see the reruns of the 1981 both the Ashes series being rerun here. It was just bewildering. AB was fuming, fuming after that test in 86. In fact, I think he stormed off and uh, he, he washed his hands with the team for, I think he needed to get away from everybody and everything. In 86, 87, when um, I think the most humiliating defeat since probably Headingley 81 at Melbourne in 86, 7, when uh, the match was over in three days, that must have just about been bottom of the barrel for AB. How he uh, managed to drag himself... Uh, onward and upward from uh, that performance um, uh, defies belief, really. I'll never forget the last Test match in Sydney. Bruce Reid and I, we, which we won, Bruce Reid and I sat down with Alan Ball and said, thanks, Abe, I know you've gone through some hell through this Test series, and he was just gutted. And he said, what are you, what are you so happy about? Just because you got 184, Dino, and Bruce, you got another five wickets. We lost the Test series, champ. We lost the Ashes. You know what that means? And that really shook me up. And he was bloody right. It was the response to the 86-87 loss um, at home of the Ashes that I think drove Australian cricket to take desperate steps. 
An important milestone in the recovery of Australian cricket was achieved in the sweltering cauldron of Eden Gardens, Calcutta, when Australia faced England in the final of the 1987 World Cup. David Boone especially was hard on England's moderate opening attack. His 75 was to win him the Man of the Match award. Eddie Hemmings took two wickets in a mini collapse, but Alan Border, the Australian captain, steered his way to a rapid 31. His fifth wicket partnership of 73 with Mike Valletta, who made 45 not out, put Australia in a strong position at 253 for five. It looked even more secure when England lost Tim Robinson for naught in their first over. Border kept England behind the run rate as Gatting was out to cricket's riskiest stroke for 41. I think I was at point at the time, so I had a full view of the shot. Um, went for the reverse sweep, executed it pretty well, but unfortunately when he hit it, it bounced off the top of his shoulder and popped straight up for Greg Dyer to catch. And that was uh, a massive turning point in the game because they, they were cruising towards victory. Before I know it, you know, we've, we've just we've made the breakthrough and bloody beauty. I've got one for none and, and pendulum phew, swings back the other way. So just amazing, you know, those little moments in time that, you know, can change. Because if, if Gat just even lets it go, it's a wide, or if he just paddled, you know, normal paddle sweep, I didn't have anyone at 45, you know, he could get four that way, but just amazing. But then number eight De Freitas offered hope when all seemed lost. He took England to within 19 runs of the target before trying one six too many. Reed's catch was the last significant moment of the game. Australia won by seven runs and took the World Cup for the first time. To finally realise that we'd, uh, you know, uh, had some success. We'd worked hard. Uh, we'd been through, a, you know, a difficult period the pre previous couple of years. But all of a sudden, you know, the realisation that you, you had won the World Cup, it was uh, quite an incredible feeling. And when we did the actual bit of when we ran around the ground celebrating the win, it was all the fireworks were going off above us. I honestly thought I was in a Hollywood movie. It's like The Natural, the movie. <laughs> Robert Redford's hit the ball into the lights and everything's just going off. But it was a fulfilment to my personal view of my faith in the players. It was a fulfilment of the, uh, the dreams and the planning had, and, uh, that had gone into the whole thing. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic. It, what really helped us there was the fact that there was a hundred and odd thousand people in the ground. 99,000 were barricading for us because they didn't want the, <laughs> the English to win. You look back on it now and it was more a sense of satisfaction that we'd achieved something for Australian cricket and, and more importantly we proved it to ourselves that we could perform on the world stage. On a blazing hot day in Adelaide during the summer of 1987-88, while on his way to his highest test score of 205, Alan Border reached another personal milestone when he passed Greg Chappell to become Australia's highest run scorer in test cricket. Australia's greatest run getter in the history of Test match cricket. He has two deliveries to do. The period between 1984 and 1989 was very tough for Australian cricket. Playing in 11 series during that time, Australia managed to win just one, a home series against New Zealand in 87-88, when last wicket pair Craig McDermott and Mike Whitney managed to hold out for a draw and give Australia a 1-0 victory in the series. Michael Whitney, two not out and starring. Last ball of the test match. Can Hadley do it? Can Whitney survive? He's done it, and Mike Whitney punches the air. Australia have forced the draw and have won the series. Australia had very little to cheer about the following summer when the West Indies pace attack again made life very difficult for the Aussie batsman. Then Patterson's frightening pace dispatched the talented New South Wales all-rounder. When you first come up against the West Indies, uh, when at, at their peak, it's it's like a sort of tornado hits you. You know, you're, you're not sure what's happening, and they're all over the top of you. It's uh, it's uh, it's intimidating. Um, you feel their presence, their aura. 
the presence and aura of the West Indian batting supremo Vivian Richards on his last tour of Australia was evident. The master blaster showed that he had lost none of his power and class. Shot. Imperious. Dynamite of Richie, that will be six. An impertinent Steve Waugh crowned the king of batsmen. I think it just came over me in, in, the, in the test in Brisbane when, I, when Viv, Viv Richards came out of bat. I thought, bugger this, it's, it's time we stood up and I'm going to give it to this bloke. So I gave him three bounces in a row. I think from that moment on, um, my attitude certainly changed. I think hopefully it changed the attitude of a few players around me that, you know, let's give it a go. If you go down, at least go down fighting. Australia was 3-0 down going into the Sydney test. Captain Alan Border starred, this time with the ball, taking a career-best 11 wickets in the match. He's out. I am a little bit embarrassed about it, but I am. I get really excited about it because it was just, you know, you don't expect it, sort of those things to happen. Um, I, you know, you like to think I can do things with the bat, but bowling was a bit of a bonus when I got wickets. Good and a, a pill, and he's out. That was the end of the windy second innings. Border picking up Ambrose for five. The tourists all out for 256, leaving the Aussies to chase just 80 runs for victory. After lunch, Border and Jones put their heads down and fittingly the now captain hit the winning runs. A way to win the test match for Australia. How appropriate the it was only the seventh time in 32 tests that Border had led his country to victory in what was a superb all-round performance. Alan Border then set his mind to the task of trying to regain the Ashes on the 1989 tour of England. Yeah, I started to sort of uh, take it more to heart about this, uh, you know, dealing with the opposition and maybe I had to have a harder edge to the way I approached things and uh, that's when I started to think about 89 going over there and I had these fantastic relationships with these blokes but um, did I need to uh, forego that to have a harder edge to maybe put them off a little bit more and, and uh, make sure that the Australian cricket team won. 89, I couldn't get a word out of him for months. Um, I was lucky at the toss to get him to speak. So, you know, you've got to say something. As the coin would go up, mm, heads. Um, we'll bat. That was it. You know, that, was, that was about as far as it went for most of the series. I think if you asked him now, he'd probably say that he maybe went a bit overboard uh, with, with the, the way he conducted himself. But having said that, it worked and it happened. And Australia. Uh, got to where they are because of his single-mindedness uh, in many ways. I mean, his determination, it rubbed off on the team. He got the tag of Captain Grumpy and all this kind of stuff. And he could be a miserable bugger at times, but he was a determined man and he wanted uh, the best for Australia and he got it. The 1989 Tour of England was the renaissance of Australian cricket. Alan Border's side thrashed England 4-0. Future Test captains Mark Taylor on his first tour scored 835 runs in the tests and Steve Waugh came of age, scoring the first two of his 32 test centuries. The 89 tour to me is still my favourite cricket tour that I've been on because, you know, we went over as complete underdogs. England had a fantastic side on paper. They had some massive names, you know, Gower, Gooch, Gadding, Botham, uh, Lamb, you know, Dilly. They had some excellent players and really they were a big favourites for that tour. We, we ended up winning 4-0 and we would have, would have won all six except for rain. So it was an outstanding achievement. Everyone did something on that tour. Short, Openers got runs. You know, AB got runs. Booney got runs. I got runs. Terry Alden was just phenomenal. 41 wickets, 19 LBWs, you know, seven bat pads. You know, he, he was just phenomenal. Heels just did not make a mistake. Merv was just brilliant. Jeff Lawson was... Just the way him and Terry Alden worked out how to get Gooch and Gower out was just some great thinking. I learned so much as a player and I learned how to win in Test cricket. That was the biggest thing. After an anxious wait, the winning runs. Unbridled delight on the pitch and unbridled delight on the Australian balcony. The team and its supporters have waited a long time to savour such a victory. Alan Border's team became the first Australian side in 55 years to regain the ashes on English soil. And the celebrations look destined to continue into the night. Especially heartwarming, the respect accorded Alan Border's contributions in both the bad years and now those of triumph. Very proud Australian, thank you. I think we all just realised, you know, it was just our moment of history that uh, we'd done something special. Um, it was a reasonably young nucleus of players. We're on the threshold of very good things and just 
you know, we, we'd done something special, we'd retain the ashes. I think what I had was relief. Uh, at that very moment, I, I felt that a huge weight had been lifted from my shoulders. We'd achieved what we set out to achieve. We did it better than we all dreamt. And just, you know, to see that final moment was the thought of, you know, that's, that's a great relief. Guys who were under Bob Simpson certainly pass on the way he coached and his attitudes, his discipline. So even now, the, the flow and effect is still happening from what Bob did, say, 10, 15 years ago, and will continue to happen in, in future years. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that he had effect on my career, which I, was, I will certainly pass on to other younger cricketers, but basically his professional attitude was, was the biggest change in Australian cricket and the way we trained. I don't think we trained properly before he came on the scene. He certainly turned that around and made us train as if we were actually in a, in a match situation, and that was, that was a massive change. To understand what happened to that side in humiliation in the early 80s and make sure that you put in place a system whereby even if you're not winning all the time, you couldn't possibly put yourselves or your cricket followers through that sort of humiliation ever again. Must be something in that ethos of 89 where that border determination, that border abrasiveness, whatever it was, whatever you want to call it, that came from the captain, I think must have infected the rest of those guys who then carried that same spirit on. They must have learnt a lot from that tour, just in terms, I think, of you know, what is possible when you all pull in that fashion and when you apply that sort of thinking uh, individually and collectively. I don't really think we've looked back from there. Uh, we've had hiccups, but um, gee, the side has just been brilliant from, from that point on. So, you know, we've all had our moments and, and come and gone, but from 89, I think Australian cricket has, has been right up there dominating. the delight of the crowds, Alan Border was presented with a replica of the famous Ashes. <laughs> Dean Jones was named Man of the Match. And Terry Alderman, Australian Man of the Series. The first man in history to take more than 40 wickets in two Ashes series. I think this is a great team and we're going to go on from greater, for greater things from, from here, I think. Well, that's the thing Australian cricket lovers would probably like to know, is whether this is the start of the renaissance of Australian cricket. Well, you know, by being in the dressing room here, you know what sort of the feeling is and it's uh, hopefully we're going to carry this on. And for Border, questions about how long he'd like to continue leading this Australian side. As long as I keep playing well, and the side are playing well and, and responded to me as captain, uh, you know, there's sort of, I would say, years.